I know, I'm very excited. We figured out what the oh, I'm already moving. We figured out what the microphone problem has been over the last week, and um, I think we have it fixed, so that's good news for worship on Sunday and Saturday and for Bible study on Wednesday. So if you are interested, there is a Bible study on Wednesdays at 9.30 in the morning. Last week we had nine, eight, eight people and me here in the room present, and we had uh, four people via Zoom. We studied the book of James. We, we set up tables so that we're spaced widely around the circle because it's a big enough room to do that. And I think it worked out really well. I was pleased that we were able to, to spread out and have a good study. So if you come, bring your Bible, bring your mask, and enter through the south entrance over there. We will come in um, that doorway uh, by the kitchen this week. Oh, uh, Lynn's playing, Nancy's singing. Thank you to both of them. The food pantry served 29 households last Monday night. <clears throat> down a little from the week before, which was 39 households, but uh, lots and lots of people being served through the food pantry right now, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing that we have that. I can't think of anything else. What? Do we ever use up all of the beans and corn and stuff like that from Christmas? Oh, from a year ago, yes. Mm -hmm. And now we still have some dinty more uh, stew in the in the classroom over there yet from this past Christmas. Um, that's still, still, some of that's still available. So, so with that, oh, a couple, just another announcement. So after uh, last weekend, our first communion service, people, I invited people to share thoughts with me about how it went and all that kind of stuff. And overall, um, the feedback that I've received, and you're welcome to give me feedback, is that it's good to be in this space with air conditioning, so we'll stay here. Also that communion seemed pretty safe and comfortable, except two issues came up, and one was that I consecrated the elements by taking the cover off, and I wasn't wearing a mask, and I stood over them, so I will, today I will not have a mask on when I do that, but I won't uncover. So that was one thing we can fix. And the other thing that's fixable is there was a concern that people were walking back to their seats without a mask. So today, take your time, because we, we have time, because um, our numbers are low, and that's okay. Um, take your time and eat your wafer, and then drink your, your juice or wine, throw your cup and cups away, and then put your mask back on before you walk back to your seats, so that as we're passing people, that people are masked. And we have to be, I'm, I'm trying to be sensitive to everybody, remember. So if some of us say, well, I don't feel that, I don't feel that that's a big deal. But if somebody does, then I want us all to try to be sensitive to that and do that. So just like wearing masks in the first place. Um, there'll be an anti-mask march, of course, here in Madison, because it's Madison, and so somebody's got to be marching every day, um, protesting something. So there's an anti-mask march on Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday. You said you were going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 500 people will get together without masks and stand shoulder to shoulder, and then we'll wonder why the numbers keep going up so bad. And the numbers are going up horribly, so um, wear your masks. That's all there is to it. I don't have anything else to share. Um, at the time of communion, Lynn will start on this side. I'll start on this side. Terry and Sue, you'll follow Lynn. Randy, you'll follow me, because you're a good follower. Um, and if some of you in the back want to socially, dis physically distance and come on this side, feel free because there's only three of you um, over on that side, so others can as well. All right, so we'll silence everything and prepare our hearts for worship during Lynn's prayer.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, your grace is amazing and far beyond our understanding. We thank you for that. Continue to move us to love one another and to avoid our human desire to judge. Give us encouragement through the gift of Jesus and his compassion for all. In your name we pray. Amen. And as I told you last week, we continue reading parables out of the 13th chapter of Matthew. So, another one today. Jesus taught in parables. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went to sleep, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then do these weeds come from? The, house, the master answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But the householder replied, No, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into the barn. Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us this parable of the weeds of the field. Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of God. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of God will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. So as I already said, Jesus uses a parable again today in that gospel lesson. It's a parable about the wheat and the weeds. And, and Jesus does that with the large crowd that's gathered. That's how it starts. And then after the crowd goes away and they get in an intimate environment, the disciples, the people closest to Jesus, ask for an explanation of the parable. Now, some may choose to see this parable as a judgment parable. The weeds get burned eventually in the story, and the wheat gets put into the granary. So if you desire an image of God who is judgmental and wrathful and legalistic, then you could pick this interpretation. But if you desire an image of a loving, compassionate, forgiving, and merciful God, then we could actually call this a parable of grace. We live in a very diverse time, in a very diverse world, and a diverse community, actually, when it comes to religious beliefs and spiritual traditions. People often out there and in our world want to draw lines. And I think this happens a lot in the church, I'm, I'm sad to say. People want to draw lines and say that there are believers on one side of the line and unbelievers, and those believers are the wheat, of course, and unbelievers on the other side. And those folks would be the weeds. That's the judgmental, legalistic element that you could pull from this parable. But that's not really how this story goes when you look at it completely. The householder, who is God, tells the slaves, who are the disciples, the workers for the householder, to leave the wheat and the weeds alone. Let them grow together in the field. It is not the slave's job to decide who is good, the wheat, and who is evil, 
the weeds. That will be done at the time of harvest. And by allowing, according to the parable, by allowing the weeds and the wheat to grow and to live together, we might even find that some of the weeds will eventually become wheat. That's the grace part of this story. You don't destroy something that you think is not good. Because here's the deal. How do you really know how God sees you? How do you really know if God sees you as wheat or as weeds? And then, how do you really know if God sees your neighbor as wheat or weeds? And how do you know how God understands people from other religious traditions or from styles of living that aren't exactly like our own? Our place is not to decide who are the weeds and who is wheat. We are not to be the judges. This parable is very clear that the followers of Christ in the church today, that's us right here in this room, small as we are, this is still the church. The followers of Christ are not called to impose our vision of fidelity and loyalty on the entire world. It is the role of the people of the church. It is the role of the church to live out our vision and our understanding of fidelity in the very best way that we can. We are called to live out our vision of fidelity by responding to God's commandment to love our neighbors and then to trust in God the householder, the one in charge, to make the final call for all of us. Our call is not as a church to go out and change other people, but to provide others with the most positive, loving example of God that we possibly can, of the God who loves all of creation and then said, after everything was created, every time God said, and it was good. So therefore, as a result of this parable, it's not our job to condemn other religions or denominations within Christianity. It's not our job to condemn atheists. It's not our job to condemn styles of living that don't align with our personal style of living. It's not our job to condemn skin color or nationality or ethnic behaviors. Instead of writing a book about the differences between Christians and Muslims, it would be far better for us to write a book that talks about the similarities between Christians and Muslims. And if you were in that Bible study a year or so ago, you know that the similarities are very significant. So years ago, and given as old as I am, that could be a long time, but it wasn't that long ago. Okay, years ago, here at Lakeview, I received an email one day from an unnamed source. You know how those are. Okay? Anything that comes without a name is a red flag. This person told me in the email that Lakeview needed to take the word Lutheran out of our title. According to the writer of the email, we are not Lutheran because of an incident that happened the incident was that I invited Patty Lowe, you probably all know her, she's a well-known native person, um, worked at the, taught at the university. I invited Patty to come here into this very room and speak to us about indigenous spirituality and how Thanksgiving is understood by local Indian communities. I'm guessing some of you were present at that meeting. I am guessing that a wheat-type good Lutheran church would apparently never invite an outsider to come and share ideas. Heaven forbid that those ideas would allow us to grow together and learn from one another and, and strengthen our own communities. Based on that email, I'm guessing that a good Lutheran church, you know, a wheat-type Lutheran church, would try to be much more restrictive of who they allowed in their, allowed in their building and who they welcomed as neighbors. So I've often thought about that email, obviously, because it was 
way over 10 years ago, and I'm still yabbering about it today. <laughs> I've often thought about that email and wondered what if this writer was upset over that little incident. Can you imagine what he or she would think about Lakeview Lutheran Church having representatives from the Sikh and the Muslim communities come and speak to us in our sanctuary? Or how would that writer feel about our congregation because we have invited people who are transgender and who dress in drag to come and speak to us in our sanctuary? And I suppose I gotta believe that that email writer would probably go way over the top and particularly think that we were not Lutherans and that we were weeds if he or she learned that Annie Laurie Gaylor and her husband from the Freedom from Religion Foundation sat with us in our sanctuary one Wednesday evening in Lent. So now think about this for a moment. How would you feel if I, the called and ordained pastor of this congregation, had the responsibility of deciding which of you were weeds and which of you were wheat, okay? It's kind of a funny thought because I have that kind of personality and you all like that because you want that personality too. Um, but I could, I could decide that and Laura could put that in the realm system. So when we brought your names up, it would say weed, <laughs> wheat, okay? That's what it's like when we do it to others. We all grow together because we trust that God has created each and every one of us in God's image. We all grow together and we learn from each other. And we offer opportunities to share God's love with many when we gather. And then, after we do that, after we welcome the weeds or the weed or whoever they are because we don't judge, then we trust. We trust that God will take care of the harvest in any way that God chooses to do that. Disciples are called to love, not to police a community. So Nancy's going to sing the hymn now. And as she sings this hymn, I want you to think about the words. The words do not say this. The words do not say, let some of us break bread together on our knees. Nancy, I invite you forward to sing the hymn.
I want to remind you that we do need soloists, people to sing the hymn, and for the next two weekends. So if anybody is able and willing to take that on, talk to Lynn. She'd be glad to uh, uh, talk to you about that. Let us pray. <clears throat> Life-giving God, continue to give a life of grace and love to your followers. Teach us to be less judgmental. Direct your church to live out your gifts in the best ways possible without trying to change others. Thank you for this opportunity to worship. We continue to seek opportunities for personal growth through our relationships with our sisters and brothers who do not think and believe exactly as we do. We condemn racism. We thank you for giving us Representative John Lewis as an example. Now give us hearts that will strive to live out his legacy of peaceful justice for all. Give us respect for the indigenous people of this land. We seek hope for anyone struggling with unemployment. Come with relief to anyone experiencing disaster. Bring comfort and hope to those who grieve including the 843 families in Wisconsin who have experienced a coronavirus death. We pray for healing for anyone who is struggling with the virus or any other health issues, including Mary, Julie, Georgia, Lois, Ellie, Ellen, Sandy, and anyone else whom we now name out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. God, you take care of us. You give us the gift of creation. You gave us the gift of creation and called all things and all people good. You gave us the gift of a Savior who has promised us life with you. You give us the gift of this simple meal to remind us of your presence in our lives and the promises you fulfill. At this table today, we are one. At this table today, we are with you. Thank you from the depths of our beings for this supper and for your great love for us. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and then he broke it and he gave it for everybody saying, take and eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all of them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And together we pray the traditional words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come and eat. The meal is ready. I would ask Lynn to come forward and begin on this side. Thank you. 
May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. May this feast that we have longed for give us courage now to go out into the world to be evangelists through our words and our actions. Amen. And receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace to share the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You are dismissed. Get out of here. <laughs>